Hello, welcome to our latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And we're joined today by Ben Williams um, up in sunny, I was going to say Fort William, but that's it's wrong. Alapool. Alapool, yes. And it's actually a little bit grey today, but you know, a bit of light <laughs> coming in, so. <laughs> Well, in that case, with, with your light, I wish you to shine your experience on us and tell us how do you engage students online? So over to you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I've been teaching at West Highland College online for about four years now. So kind of pre-COVID, if you like. So not out of necessity because of the pandemic, but out of necessity just because of where we are rurally. Um, and West Highland College has been doing that for about 10 years and UHI more broadly than that. So... Um, really were kind of using technologies and things like this for a long time and we've got college centres from Kinloch Leven down in the south up to Ullapool in the northwest and all across Sky and everything in between so and these campuses are often quite small so you know having this online capability not only has allowed us to engage with a broader range of students but often it's to do with class size as well because we're so um, geographically uh, dispersed as it were in terms of population. Um, so yeah, I've been really enjoying online teaching, um, but I was talking about my wife earlier who's a, a chemistry teacher and she's just had to flip everything to online learning in a very short space of time because of the pandemic. So it's interesting to see, you know, everybody kind of scrabbling to this, but I know a lot of universities and things have been doing distance learning and online learning for a long time. But I think we're definitely seeing a kind of progression of more kind of blended learning and more kind of uh, movement towards different techniques for doing that. So I was hoping today just to kind of talk through some of the platforms that I'm using um, and uh, some of the ways in which I try to engage with my students. So hopefully uh, we can get through quite a bit in 20 minutes or so um, and then if anybody has any questions or whatever that should be plenty of time hopefully. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you Hopefully that's now working. So you should be able to see Google or G Suite at the moment. Can I just check you guys can see that okay? Uh, grand. Um, so I have another number of classrooms set up um, on Google. Um, I'm actually using a classroom from the previous year. When I first started st teaching, I, I tended to set up a new classroom every year um, and kind of populate it uh, as I went along. But I found kind of as I've got more confident with the technology, it's actually easier just to remove a cohort and then uh, replace them with the new students coming in. Um, so what I tend to do is just create a new topic within the classwork element um, called new pupils or newbies, if you like. Um, and then I talk them through where everything is. So I've already got the structure there from the previous year in terms of the units, um, provide them with core notes for the course um, and learning materials. Um, so new pupils is kind of the thing I set up just when people are starting the course um, and I provide them with um, a bunch of links. So for example, the timetable, recommended textbooks, although there are other um, retailers available, uh, the higher course uh, business specification, um, some links to other study materials and things. Um, and I've actually been getting them, because of the COVID situation, been getting them to kind of fill out their own register as they come in. So a bit of kind of flipped classroom technique, make them do the work sort of thing. Um, and I find that's really good as you, you can just set up a spreadsheet and then you can actually allow students to, to edit the file so they can all go in and actually co-create that as we go through. And it's quite a good wee thing just to get them into the habit of doing that um, on a daily basis sort of thing. Um, I was using Google Hangouts mostly for the previous years, but we're moving away from that now to Google Meetings. So um, I'm having, you know, a recurring meeting every time we have a live class. Um, and I tend to, um, I'll just see if this will work because it'll be almost um, a screen share within a screen share. So I'll just move this over slightly. Um, I tend to screen share a lot of what I do. So when we're doing live sessions, um, obviously you've got the chat. One of the disadvantages of meetings though, unlike Hangouts, is it doesn't record the, the session. It doesn't record the chat. So once you go out, it's gone forever sort of thing. So I quite like that about Hangouts is if you were sharing things, then you could always look back over it. So if it was, for example, um, quiz results or prelim results that you'd shared or discussions that you had in the past, whereas meetings doesn't have that facility. So it's kind of limited. So I tend to use it in connection with something else, either Hangouts or um, Google Chat as well. Um, so a combination of different things. So I usually just screen share, but I will 
kind of drop like links into the chat and things as we work through. Um, so pretty kind of basic stuff. It's quite intuitive. Um, I'm going to come out of that because it might just cripple my internet connection. So just going to have a look at some of the ways that I would lecture. And what I tend to do is to make sure there are lots of interactive elements um, within the lecture slides themselves. So it's kind of counterintuitive to what you would maybe normally do in a live session or a face-to-face -face class in that I've broken it up with lots of activities within the actual slides themselves. Uh, what I tend to do is actually copy and paste these over as we work through the lecture onto the actual stream itself so that and I'll do that live so that students can follow me because it might be that we're doing just a group discussion or we're doing um, group work where they have to co-create slides and things like that. Um, so I'll then set that up as an actual task on Google. Um, so I find that really useful for keeping them engaged. Um, but there'll be a number of things within that. Um, so for example, links to videos, um, links to external resources where they can read about things. Um, articles, etc. And again, I'll kind of copy and paste those links over into um, uh, Google Meetings so they can find the links quite easily. Um, so it's more interactive for them. Uh, you do have obviously the issue of not being able to see students all the time. Um, I know a number of lecturers um, have basically have their cameras on all the time or if they've been in a classroom setting having a ca camera pointed at them um, but I tend to kind of operate on a on a trust basis I kind of uh, explicitly at the start say you know I'm going to treat you like a college student rather than a, uh, a school pupil and I find that that works quite well um, I will usually have a couple of sessions where I'll ask, ask them to put their cameras on introduce themselves and we'll do a range of kind of answers question and answer sessions where I'll ask them to comment on a quick question, for example, um, and go around the class and ask them to put their mics on. And I think that's really important to actually get them interacting right from the start, um, because otherwise they can just log into the classroom, keep their camera and mic off, and then you never hear a word from them. And sometimes you'll get issues over that, I think. So it's always just checking in with them as well. So checking they can see my screen, checking that they've followed what I've said, um, short bursts of teaching followed by interactive kind of questions and answers and things like that. Um, so yeah, collaborating on documents is quite a useful thing. And what we've been working on recently is this kind of group task for my higher business course. So they've got to come up with a business idea that we're gonna use as we run through the course. Um, and I've been using kind of Hangouts, I suppose, to set them up in groups. So I've got four different groups within Hangouts that I've set them up in. Um, and then they can collaborate in their teams and I can keep an eye on what they're doing, help them, give them links, et cetera. So I'm kind of guiding them through that process. Um, and then I'm actually in the slides with them. So each of their groups, they'll be co-creating slides. Um, and I find it's really useful um, for things like commenting as you go through. So I'm actually working in the documents with them as they're doing that. Uh, yeah, so virtual classrooms within classroom is another kind of useful tool for keeping them engaged. But it's one of those things that's really difficult to maybe reach the students that are less academic or might need additional support. So it's this constant checking. Can you um, keep up with what I'm saying? Have you got the link? Um, what I like about this is you can see who's doing what. So if you've got three or four students working on a project like this um, and you can obviously um, comment or place comments as you go along. So quite easy just to add comments as they work through these things as well. Um, what I was talking to my uh, other half recently because she's just started working online and she's kind of created um, a virtual classroom within a virtual classroom, which I think is really cool. Um, and I asked her if I could share what she's been doing because it's something I plan to implement over the summer when I've got a bit more time. Um, and she's kind of set up a slide, if you like, as a Google Classroom. So uh, I'll just show you it now. So that's my uh, uh, wife or an emoji of my wife. And I think she uses a program called Bitmoji or something like that. But what she's done is basically make a virtual uh, replica of her actual chemistry class, which I think is really clever, um, with links in there as well. So you can obviously uh, click on the teacher to get instructions and things like that. So 
get um, links to various tasks and things, which I think is really useful. Sorry, too many tabs open now. So you can click uh, the laptop, for example, would take you to uh, the presentation for the week. And then she'll just update the links every week um, so that they, the links within that virtual kind of classroom, if you like, will take the students to the relevant place within the actual Google Classroom. Um, and the feedback that she got from that was really positive. So uh, pupils found it more engaging than just seeing a list of work uh, on Classroom. They like navigating and clicking their way through different activities. Um, less able pupils or visual learners really like the use of virtual classroom. So um, really positive feedback on that. And I think that that is kind of a trend in the way that things are moving that will become more kind of like virtual spaces or 3D spaces where avatars are used or there's more gamification. So maybe moving away from things like um, social media type feeds and more into kind of virtual spaces. So although it's kind of at a basic level, it's definitely something that I've kind of found useful talking to her. We tend to share best practice. And I was like, that's a great idea. Can I plagiarize that um, for my uh, talk today? So I just, I found that really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, doing a lot of flipped classroom and actually getting the students to um, create quizzes and things themselves. So I'll do a range of things on classroom. Um, Let's just go into some one of the topics, for example. So I'll have lecture slides, but I'll also have core notes that they can use and I'll give them time each week to actually do um, work through the notes and then ask them to send me photos and things of their work. Um, so there's a range of things you can do there. Um, so we do a lot of things where they'll have to create documents and assign them, um, but also getting them to um, you know, do revision topics and things like coming up with uh, mind maps and things or creating quizzes at the end of a topic area I find really useful. And it's, it's in, a, in a physical classroom, you would do it naturally. You would just say, okay, let's go around the, the class and check for understanding. Whereas in the, the kind of virtual world, what I'm doing is trying to break it up between quite kind of formal or formal assignments and actually little questions where we can have discussions of, uh, as a class. Um, so it's, it's breaking it up a lot more and just trying to, I suppose, be a lot more deliberate about that as well. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover in Google Classroom. Um, I'm not gonna go over too much of the ins and outs because I know you'll all be familiar with the technology. I mean, it's quite intuitive to add students to it and set up assignments and things like that, but I would obviously be happy to share any of that if you wanted to look at it in more detail. Um, I was gonna look a little bit now at uh, Brightspace and Collaborate, which we've also been using. Um, so this is kind of the homepage of one of my units, which is economic issues. Um, and we've got a built-in kind of virtual classroom to that. It's almost the kind of feed-in kind of add into it. And I think that's changing um, towards the end of the summer uh, and it's being updated to the new WebEx virtual classroom. So and not another tool to have to learn in a very short space of time. Um, but we tend to use like a combination of this. Obviously it's a bit of a higher level, which is HNC. So we'd expect students to be a wee bit more kind of uh, self-starter type. Um, so I'm going to open this. I'm not sure if this will work with the double kind of screen share element, the screen share within a, a screen share. Um, but this is Collaborate, um, which most of you will probably be familiar with. There's a couple of options there where you can access settings and recordings if you want to record sessions. Um, but your room just stays live really and you can just enter that when you're ready to start your session. <laughs> It's so a shame I don't have any students in here to really kind of demonstrate it properly. Um, but in terms of the actual technology itself, again, it's very intuitive. You know, you've got your options down the bottom. You can be happy, surprised, disappear if you like, put your hand up, etc. The main thing I use, I suppose, is the, the share files. So again, with um, lectures and things like that, I'll tend to include a lot of these links and things to external articles and tasks. Um, there's some useful things within uh, Collaborate actually, um, such as breakout rooms, but I actually preferred the older version because you could actually see all the rooms as they broke out. And I'll show you that in a wee minute. Um, I'm just trying to find a good example of a presentation that would show you the various links and things. 
Yeah, so I have built-in activities that break up the lecture. So we're only ever kind of teaching for, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes at a time, just so it's very um, broken up in, in terms of engaging the students and constantly checking back as well with videos and things like that. Um, so yeah. Um, in terms of uh, breakout rooms and things, there's a, a number of options. You can um, use this tool to, to break out groups here. You can share your camera, you can share a blank whiteboard, for example. You've then got a number of tools where you can ask students to type on things. So if you had a question within the presentation, they can then um, answer directly onto the question, for example. Um, and I find that the breakout rooms are really good as well. Um, so got options where if you have participants in here you can drag and drop them into groups and then split them out into to, to teams to work on various activities. Um, so that's Collaborate, it's fairly intuitive. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any other kind of main features um, to talk about. Oh yeah, if you've got your participants there they'll just show up below you as participants and you can actually um, use the little settings to make them pr presenters, if you like. So if you want them to present something back or take over the class or get them to actually feedback, then that's really useful too. Um, so we use a range of things within um, Brightspace, which I'm kind of still learning at the moment. So there's a few things I maybe want to just show you all quickly that I've kind of come across that are really useful. Um, quizzes are really good. So you can set up quizzes in advance that are quite interactive um, and they'll actually mark themselves if you've got a marking scheme there and you put in the, the marking then. Um, we used this for an alternative assessment this year because of COVID. So um, someone had an additional attempt that we needed to assess. So it was really good because actually the marking's semi-automatic. If there's questions that are written, then you have to go in and mark them manually. But um, really good way of kind of um, showing interactive learning. Um, and I'll just maybe bring that up and show you if I can find it. Bear with me a second. So that's the right one. Sorry, I've got duplicate shells at the moment because um, they create new ones over the summer so that you've got a new cohort. So I need to find the correct one. I think that's the one. Yeah, so this is a colleague's um, version of the same module, but she's actually um, built in, and sure she won't mind me showing you this. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Built in the sessions interactively, so within Brightspace you can then open up the, the interactive sessions and there's quizzes as you go through. So it's quite a powerful tool in, in terms of engaging students because you can have um, you know, links to the articles, little quizzes as you work through. Um, so a different way of working rather than having lecture slides and things. So that's something that, that we're going to look at over the summer as well. Um, so for students, it's, it's clear as they work through the material when they finish something. Um, but also it gives them that kind of blended learning in terms of having quizzes, having, you know, checking for understanding and it not just being, you know, two hours of, of me lecturing them, <laughs> which is not what you want. Um, so that's really useful as well. Um, what else can I talk about? Uh, this is one of the, the things I was playing around with this year as well was, was awards, which is kind of in the, the realms of uh, gamification. Um, you'll need to forgive me because I've still got live students on this, but Kenji uh, has told me that it shouldn't be an issue in terms of when this goes live. So um, we've got a number of course awards here that some of them are, are or automatic, so if a student completes a piece of work, they'll automatically get an award. Um, some of them are manual, so I can only um, issue those awards. So for example, I've got one called Academic Excellence that I'll give to my star pupil for the year, um, and I'll give that manually. But a number of these awards that you create, so can have parameters. So for example, this one, they'll get this prudent student. Um, basically the student has submitted the first assessment and they'll get a little award for that. And then once one of the students knows they've got an award, other people start to go, well, how did you get an award for that? Well, I submitted the first assignment. So it's this kind of gamification, if you like. Oh, you've got a badge, I want a badge too. So that's really interesting. Um, and I find that's quite good. And there's various ones I've set up for teamwork, if there's group work. Uh, what else have I got? Halfway through the course. Um, I can show you some of the other ones. And you can add these manually and select badges or you can choose your own kind of logos and things like that. Um, 
so you can set conditions on these, which is really good so that they're all automated or you can just deliver them as and when you went. So global intelligence, I think was one where they'd um, read all the materials. So accessed everything and read everything. Um, nobody got that this year, bit of a shame, Never mind. So that's really interesting and it's something we've been playing around with a bit. Um, and the other thing that's really useful is this intelligent agents uh, list. Um, so with intelligent agents, you can kind of set up a little agent within Brightspace to kind of do something on your behalf. So I might say something like student, uh, a student check-in, for example. Um, and then you can set parameters. So what this will do is it will automate something within Brightspace for you. So it might, for example, tell your, your students that you're not doing enough work <laughs> or try and encourage them to access the materials a little bit more. Um, so yeah, uh, rolling class list, you can obviously play around with the different settings. What I might want to do is set like login activity. So if the user hasn't logged in for say a week, seven days, for example, or it could be course activity, something to do um, with them not access, accessing part of the course or something that I've asked them to look at. And once you've set your parameters, you can set the action that you want the agent to do on your behalf. So you can automate it to send an email, for example. Um, obviously, you would just put in the students relevant um, to the course, so you can automate that part as well with the subject. So it might be something like, remember to study economics this week, and a little message to say, you haven't accessed the materials for this week. Are you aware that you need to do X amount of self-study hours per week, or whatever that might be? Um, and then once you've set that up and the parameters are set up, you'll um, they'll automatically get an email if they haven't been active on the learning. Um, or on uh, Brightspace, the, the learning um, portal, for example. So they're really useful. And I suppose that's kind of a drawback of Google in a lot of ways, in that we don't have that kind of same, there is some analytical tools in there, um, but there's not the same kind of automation in terms of that. Um, but Kenji was telling me the other day that there are extensions and things that you can use within that. Um, so that's really in, uh, interesting as well. So, what time are we on? I think that'll probably do. Um, I'm just thinking if there were any questions, but also if you wanted to talk a little bit more about extensions and things for Google, there are some useful ones. So I tend to use Screencastify um, as another recording tool. So that's not actually built into meetings, um, but is part of the Google kind of, I think I pay a small subscription for that. It's not expensive, but you can use the free version. I think we get about, 30 minutes of recording time, it's really useful. Um, there's also one, I had a recent one where uh, a pupil of mine was really, really autistic and couldn't really deal with um, the whiteness of the screen all the time, so reading documents. And there's one that you can, uh, an extension called uh, black and white, where you can just plug that into your browser and it'll turn the documents or change the color of the documents. So what I find is if there, there's something you're trying to do, there's usually an extension for it. So don't be scared to kind of look for those things. I had to kind of play around with those and, and, and find the ones that, that were better, but yeah. So I think that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Ben. Um, there, there was, um, there, there were some questions. Uh, I, I noticed Kathy had asked uh, a question. She may want to unmute herself and ask you herself um, about your virtual classrooms. Sure. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, I've had some problems with this microphone. Um, I was just asking how the you know, white spiritual classroom was made. Was, you, was it made in with a Google tool or did I separate tool or just done PowerPoint? How did you put it together? Um, the Google classroom, you mean? Yeah, I had a little a, a fake chemistry class running a virtual. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the one I showed my wife's uh, yeah, virtual one. Yeah, um, one. She's just used Google Slides for that and then populated the background um, with various objects and then she's linked those objects to. Um, the areas in her classroom, just like you would link to a YouTube video or something. The so, kind of thing. yeah, uh -huh. I mean, uh, I'm just seeing if I can go back to screen share. Hang on. <laughs> I'll show you. Um, useful kind of to know if I can open Google again is if you have a specific thing within classroom, if it'll load. 
struggling now. I think too many things open. Yeah, so if you've got a particular element within, so it might be the core notes, for example, that you wanted to link something, for example, in that virtual presentation to, um, you can actually uh, just copy the link from that and put that as the, the, the URL to that object. So you insert that. You can also um, copy the link to a post, which is really useful, um, and then copy and paste that into wherever. So you're just creating pictures or objects really within that um, presentation, and then you're going to f link them to the various areas within your virtual classroom, your other virtual classroom. <laughs> your stream, that's probably the best way to differentiate it. Okay. That uh, help. Is that good, Kathy? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, any other questions? My, you have a lot of icons on your or <laughs> desktop. Yeah, oh, I need Owen. to tidy, tidy that up. <laughs> Let's not look at that. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, so uh, you've got your Brightspace, you've got the Google, how do you decide which one to use? Is it what you're told to do by the institution or do you, get, do you choose according to the class or according to what you're trying to achieve? Usually it's an institutional thing. So the schools link classes have to be delivered through G Suite to an extent because it's still part of the school and that's interacting with the, the, the G Suite that they have. So they have that technology, they've all got Chromebooks. So that's really the reason for that. Um, however, when they sign up for college, they technically become a college student. So there, there is a choice there, I think, um, depending on the course and the level of the course. So if it's, for example, um, a freestanding college course, um, that school leavers have left for, then I'd probably say Brightspace. Um, I'd, I think Sarah might be able to answer that question better than I can, my cals here, Sarah Bruce. So um, I've just been kind of going with, with schools classes being on Google and uh, a higher level being on Brightspace. I think you, you could deliver on, on Brightspace. There's no restrictions on that, I don't think. And do you have a preference yourself? Do you like one over the other? Um, I think I prefer Brightspace, to be honest. Um, I just find that it's much cleaner to use. Google keeps changing little elements that uh, kind of you have to keep up with. Um, with Google, I'm finding there's a lot of using multiple things to try and achieve what I can do in Brightspace quite easily. So yeah, I would have to say Brightspace is probably my preferred option at the moment. And uh, Ben, if I, if I can ask, um, when it comes to like keeping students engaged, how, how, do you, how do you ensure that everyone has like a equal time online in terms of participation? Like, do you find that some people still lurk in the background and how do you get them to come forward? Yeah, there's a massive issue with that. And it's not as easy as if you were in a physical classroom because you notice these things much more readily. Um, because you know it's much easier to go around and, and be more supportive um, in a physical environment um, but I think by working with them in the tasks that they're doing you start to notice pretty quickly students that maybe aren't talkative um, maybe aren't contributing in group work or maybe you know the level of work that they're submitting they're not engaging with I mean we've had quite a lot of issues I think with attendance and such because of COVID and the, the current situation so but even before that we've had and it depends on the cohort. I've had really good cohorts where um, students are, you know, really engaged. And then I've had ones where it can depend on the group they're with at school. So if they're in a location at school where they don't have that supervision, they can kind of get distracted. So it's really just about noticing it early on and then reaching out to them. And there's a number of ways you can do that via email, knowing that the, the support is there. Because often they don't want to share things in that kind of social, it's a social anxiety thing a lot of the time, I think. Um, and that's exacerbated in a way by the technology. So it's just, I think, using a range of different approaches to actually uh, reach out to those students. I will kind of go around the class and pick on them sometimes and make sure that everybody's contributing. And I think that that's um, maybe a bit of a, an archaic way of doing it. But I find that, that if you get them talking to each other really quickly, when you start the, the first few classes and you get them used to the fact that they're going to have to use their mics they're going to have to sometimes have their videos on when, when appropriate that actually that kind of breaks the ice with them a little bit 
um, you'll always get the odd one who just, you know, sits with the mic off or the camera off. And they're the really difficult ones sometimes to get to. And I definitely think it's di more difficult online um, to ensure that. The academically inclined ones will always do well with this kind of learning because they can access the course, the materials. So um, it's, it's more difficult and more challenging, I think, with the ones that we maybe need a wee bit of additional support. Um, and I just kind of do my best, I suppose, to, to make sure that they're included. And communication with the school or communication with the parents is key as well. Um, uh, and so it often takes a lot of kind of thinking, okay, this student hasn't attended, this student isn't um, submitting work on time. So what are my ports of call there? Especially with Schools Link, you can go to the guidance teacher, you can talk to the deputy head, you can talk to the parents as well. Um, but really just trying to include them, I suppose, I suppose, and actually trying to bring them along with the class is, is, is the main way. I'm, I'm just going to squeeze in one more question before we finish our recording here. But you had mentioned um, that you potentially deliver two hour classes <laughs> online, <laughs> which uh, that even makes me scared. Um, <laughs> how, how do you sustain that kind of engagement? over um, two hours of an online uh, session. Again, I suppose kind of treating them like adults. So I'll usually give them a wee 10 minute break for coffee and they love that, you know, even just 10 minutes to get away from the screen. And that sounds daft, but something quite simple like that, you know, and if they know that from the start of the class, they're getting a bit of a break in between. Um, and again, just breaking up the learning as well. So I might introduce a topic and then they might go off and do a bit of work on that. Um, there's times where I'll flip it. So we'll do maybe, you know, 30 minutes of teaching and then they'll get some self-study time. Um, peer reviewed stuff as well is really good. So getting them to kind of work on each other's work or mark each other's work um, fills up time as well. So it's just splitting that two hour block um, and into kind of relevant shorter chunks, I think. Um, but yeah, also just having a really good mix of, I'd say that the develop, a lot of the, the course materials I'm using are, have been shared from other UHI partners, but I have developed some of my own ones. And what I find is actually preparation is king in online learning. So if you can prepare your, your whole course in, a, in, in essence in advance, and not everybody has had the luxury to do that recently, but you know, I'll have a scheme of work. I'll have, you know, all my lectures, all my notes, all the little tasks developed and what we're going to do each week in advance. And that's kind of, a, I suppose, a luxury of been having, do, uh, having done it for so long is that I'm able to then, you know, make sure that that content is split in a way that it's, it's much more engaging for them rather than just talking at them for, for two hours at a time. So... Okay, well, well, that brings us to the end of our 30 minutes for the recorded part of the session. So, Ben, thank you very much for your insights and your advice. And uh, also, thanks to your colleague, Sarah, who was, was helping out in the chat there. <laughs> but that's, that's brilliant. So, for, thanks, everyone who's watching, <laughs> for everyone who is watching, uh, thanks for joining us today. And hopefully, you'll be able to join us for a future um, virtual bridge session. So I'd love to. Then. And yeah, thanks, Kenji. <laughs> Stay safe.